Joining us right now to talk about this is Ambassador Roman Papaduk, former ambassador to the Ukraine under President George W. Bush and now a principal at Bingham Consulting. Thanks for being with us, Ambassador. I'm glad to be with you, but that was President George H.W. Bush. Oh, I apologize there. We had a missing letter there That's in our okay. script, but thank you very <laughs> much for the clarification. That's okay. Uh, under po President George H.W. Right. Bush. All right, back to the, uh, the questions here at hand. Um, and, uh, Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott there, uh, highlighting a historic problem with Putin. Should anybody take him at his word? Well, it's very difficult given the track record that's been in existence over the past few months uh, relevant to Ukraine. We've seen a number of occasions where the uh, actions that the president of Russia undertakes are quite different from the words uh, that he utters. So I think the uh, jury has to be out in terms of judging what those words will mean for the future course of events in that part of the world. So I'd be a little bit more skeptical in terms of taking the words at face value. Now, Ambassador, is the United States doing enough diplomatically when it comes to our relationship with Ukraine and Russia? I think the United States has been doing all it can do in terms of consulting with the allies and undertaking unilateral, unilateral actions such as the sanctions that were announced last week. Mm -hmm. I think, though, however, in view of what has happened with the Malaysian airliners, there's an opportunity here to maybe move the process forward a little bit. In this respect, what I would uh, refer to is the need f to a restart or a call for a ceasefire. Uh, the Ukrainians have indicated their willingness to talk with the rebels in the past. The rebels have not been willing to lay down their arms and engage in, in discussions. But parallel to a ceasefire, I think the United States needs to make clear that there has to be a sealing off of the Russian-Ukraine border and that uh, there have to be international monitors positioned along the border to gauge whether or not uh, uh, there are personnel and military equipment being brought in from Russia into Ukraine. In that context, I think then meaningful discussions can take place in eastern Ukraine. But if that does not work, I think it's very incumbent on the United States to take a more forthright role, and I mean on two levels. Number one is an increased uh, use of sanctions, broader sanctions, and at the same time, there's time for us to revisit the possibility of giving military assistance to the Ukrainians. If you look at the last three weeks, the Ukrainian military has been moving forward against the uh, rebels slowly, but uh, has been moving and overcoming them. And uh, it was in that context that the Russians then in introduced heavy equipment in order to stop the Ukrainian movement. That heavy equipment has to be stopped from coming into Ukraine, and the Ukrainians will be able to I deal with the issue itself on the ground. But, you know, I, it's more important to solve issues peacefully rather than through military means. And I think the president has to ally himself with the Europeans in order to push a, more sh a much stronger diplomatic solution along the lines I've just outlined. Well, let's talk about those sanctions a little bit more because we know the president uh, announced some new sanctions before uh, the Malaysia Airlines flight was down last week. Um, you know, and then there's po the prospect of more sanctions here. But what would those look like? I think the importance in this case is to move very rapidly in sanctions. In the past, when sanctions have been applied, they've taken a, a long time be between the action that the Russians have undertaken and the sanctions. Almost the meaning of those, or the meaningfulness of those sanctions was, was dissipated. At the same time, they weren't broad enough. I think what the West, and particularly the Europeans and the United States, have to look at is a need to have broad sectoral sanctions, and I would probably target the financial area of Russia as well as the energy sectors. Those are two very, very sensitive areas for Russia in terms of their economy, and this is something that will have very, very strong ramifications throughout the whole Russian economy. I think we have to move away from just targeting individuals. Those kinds of sanctions are more symbolic than, uh, very, than being very effectual, so I think we have to move into broad sectoral sanctions at this stage. Now, is the reason why we have not done that yet up until this point is because of the pushback that we might get from, uh, say, Germany? I think there were two reasons for, uh, for this uh, lack of sectoral sanctions. Number one is the disunity that exists in, uh, among the Western allies in Europe. There are various countries who have different agendas vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Some uh, favor sanctions, some do not, so it's very difficult to build a consensus. But I think th another reason is something that we started talking about at the outset of this uh, program, and that is the fact that people have tried to take Putin at his word. Every time an incident took place uh, relevant to Ukraine, Putin would come out with the right statements, and people would think, well, maybe this is the time, maybe at this time he will be changing his mind, maybe Russia will be engaging in a more positive manner. And each time we've seen that's not the case. 
Now, Ambassador, going back to the down plane, John Kerry says the drunken separatists are interfering at the crash, crash site. How can we respond to that? Well, I think it's very important, uh, as the international community has been saying over the past three days, that there has to be a forthright, uh, even-handed investigation, uncomplicated by anyone tampering with the evidence. And unfortunately, these kinds of reports about drunken rebels uh, being in the fields and dealing with the uh, potential evidence uh, indicates that there probably is a smaller chance of having an unbiased uh, and clean investigation take place. I'm hopeful, however, that forensic experts might be able to piece a lot of the evidence together. But each day and each hour as it goes by, it becomes a, it becomes a little bit more difficult to get this kind of uh, situation under control where the uh, evidence will be uncomplicated by extraneous uh, handling of it. Yeah. And I know Britain has called for the ability to investigate on their own because how can we you know, expect impartial answers when the black box seems to be in the hands of separatists? That's correct. I think each country that's lost uh, uh, citizens in this tragedy wants to have its investigators on the ground. I know a number of countries have already, including the United States, have sent uh, investigators to Kiev to get engaged in this process. So it's very important for all the countries that have lost victims to be engaged in this process. And it's actually this kind of uh, pressure from the international community that hopefully will open up the investigation uh, on a fair basis and at the same time maybe pressure the Russians to become a little bit more forthcoming in trying to solve this issue in eastern Ukraine. All right, well, we'll see what happens on that front. Uh, ambassador Papadou, thank you very much for your time. You're a former ambassador to Ukraine under President George H.W. Bush. Great checking in with you, sir. Thank you. So we'll wait on that, but uh, Morgan, as we heard earlier today, Dutch officials who are on the ground there, forensic experts, say things are not well there, no real sealing of the crime scene, and not a lot of information being shared with those pro-Russian separatists. We're keeping our eye on this story as well as many others, Absolutely. and we're back with more after this.